Let us turn to Romans chapter 16, please. Now, it is very important to understand that Christians are supposed to mark. We're supposed to mark those who teach something that is wrong, contrary to the doctrine of the Word of God. We're supposed to mark it. But we cannot mark it if we keep it abstract and don't point it out. So that's why we have to point out preachers who teach something wrong. Because the Bible says mark them. Now it's people. You mark people. Verse 17. Yeah. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. Now a lot of people, they might accuse me that I am being divisive because I address all sorts of preachers. And they can be false prophets and other people with actual good intentions. But I mark them and I show them what's wrong through the word of God. And depending on how much of a, I hope people understand this, how much of a jerk the false prophet is, I either be very hard sarcastically, depending on how much accountability and blood is on their hand, it depends on my severity. Or if the person, you know, is uh, honest and sincere intention, I go light on them. But the point is, is that whatever level it is, I have to mark them. Right. And I am not divisive. Those people are divisive. Yeah. You might say, why is that? Read verse 17. When you mark those, you're marking those because they cause division. Not, right? They're the ones that cause disunity. Why? Because they, disunif they break you away from right doctrine. Right. Yeah. They break you away from yeah. right doctrine. So that has to be pointed out no matter what. And people do not understand that. Okay, uh, if your hand is at Colossians 4, your other hand to go to the book of 2 John, please. 2 John. 2 John. Now, there's a person who I would highly recommend to learn a lot. And I'll be honest, I learned a lot from this man as well. And I actually recommended his book online. And it is Walter Martin's book, Kingdom of the Cults. But the guy who did the editing work is Ravi Zacharias. So Ravi Zacharias, he is a man that undoubtedly, I know for a fact, that the Lord has mightily used on apologetics. However, I am not a dummy either. Now, what do you mean by that? If a person has so much popularity and open opportunities to speak at conferences, they don't get those open doors unless they made compromises. Yeah. You don't get that unless you make friends and buddy-buddy with people. Yeah. And Ravi Zacharias, I am very sorry to say, but if a person who is very honest listen to Zacharias' stuff, he is very political. So the way that he talks, he gets along with any denomination out there. So I am going to point out evidences over here that what he did was actually wrong. Now, don't get me wrong. I believe that we should be all things to all men, that we might win some. Amen? I believe in that. Right. So whatever it takes to give them the gospel. But here's the point. Whatever it takes, as long as what? As long as I'm not crossing into territory that contradicts the word of God. Right. Right. If my testimony is sullied because I'm supposed to be a representative of Jesus Christ, then I'm in wrong territory over here. Amen. Okay, so when we do compromising here now I recognize that now some people think that compromise is an ugly word but you gotta understand this it's according to the Apostle Paul it's being all things to all men that you might win some so we have to do that but it's not like you're in or out it goes in different lines over here it goes in different lines over here so then what it goes into the lines of where you see these unbelievers here what it should always be done is that it should be at different levels. It's not like, okay, I'm all the way here with just Bible believers, and then I'm going to be 100% accurate in everything that I teach, and then you're going to realize that preachers have their differences. Okay? Shocking, I know, but it is true. You know why? We all have a love of the book and we all study the Bible. And when everyone independently studies the Bible for themselves, the Lord's going to show them something that other people have not seen. And then what's going to happen is how the Lord guides you in time. Trust me, 
Give it about two years as you study deeper into doctrine, you're going to find out you disagree with everybody except yourself. And then later on in life, you're going to mature and grow and realize there are things that I even disagree with myself on. That's what you're going to realize. So there's obviously, so I'm not uh, kicking Zacharias like he's not 100% in every minute detail like I am. No, there's obviously a limit. But you got to also consider this side too. If how we can tell Zacharias is more for compromise rather than here, but the Bible says by their fruits, ye shall know them. Now, let's look at his fruits. And then I want you to make the decision. That's the simple way to do it. I want you to make the decision and see if he tends to be more here or tends to be more here. Now, if you tend to be more here than here, then you know you're wrong, right? right. Then you know you're wrong. All right. So Ravi Zacharias, the Lord mightily used him, but he had an open door for apologetics because of the compromises that he made. So the first thing is concerning about an infamous video, and you can find it on YouTube, is Roman Catholicism a cult? Now, I watched that video, and if you ask me, is Roman Catholicism a cult? You know what my answer is? Yes. yes. Next Amen. question. Amen. 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 Qureshi was there, and all these people, and then when the person asked him the question, is Catholicism a cult? Look, he can give an intelligent answer. I don't care if he gives a 10-minute intelligent answer that goes like this. I can let that go. But then why did he start it out like when people were nervously laughing, yeah. and then he said, it's like a question, do you want to be axed or hanged? Why would you say that? You know why? He knows that's uncomfortable to him. Yeah. It's politics because he needs the connections. That's the problem over there. So if you watch that video, he went all the way around like this instead of just saying plainly yes. Amen. A second video that I want to add is, uh, it's called Mormon Teaching Ravi Zacharias Must See. Mormon Teaching Ravi Zacharias Must See. Now in that one, he tries to define what a cult is, just like in that Roman Catholic video when he was asked that question. Now a lot of people were against him for going to the Mormon tabernacle, and they saw it as a sign of compromise. Now what I'm going to do is this. What I'm going to do is actually give him the 90% benefit of the doubt, actually. Because me, I'm totally fair, okay? And I don't want people to criticize me. You don't understand Zacharias' mentality. No, I understand. He wants to proclaim the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And yeah, if you have it in the Mormon tabernacle, trust me, I would take the opportunity too, yeah. man. Yeah. I would do that, man. That's a great opportunity over there. But the problem is this. The problem is that when he was asked the question about Mormonism being a cult and Roman Catholicism being a cult, he kind of went like this with Mormonism, and he admitted that uh, the classic, historic Mormonism, he termed it that way because I don't know what he thinks about modern Mormonism. So there's a reason why they ter use words, you got to understand, in order to get along with everybody not to hurt people's feelings. Right, right. So that's my guesswork, but let's throw that aside. Maybe he didn't mean that. But the point is, is that he did mention yes for Mormonism. If I'm wrong then people can correct me, and that's fine. And that just makes Zacharias more of a worse person, actually, then. If he didn't admit Mormonism, yes, it's a cult. But me, I'm just trying to give him the benefit of the doubt here. That's what I'm trying to do over here. But then with Roman, uh, how he defined a cult when he was talking about Mormon, Mormonism and Roman Catholicism, he said yes for Mormonism, but Roman Catholicism, he didn't get there. He gave a clever last line, you can be a good Christian, but a bad Catholic. And then everybody was clapping their hands like this. It's because what he's trying to point out is this. He's trying to point out that doctrines, you know, all these things concerning about a cult is defined as, and he kept saying this, it's deviating from the historic work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's done by one individual. That's what, what he did. You know why? Because he knows that if he doesn't mention that last line, it's done by one individual then uh, if he doesn't add that line, then he's going to have to include Catholicism with the de his definition of a cult. Yeah. Yeah. 
You know why? Because Catholicism, it's not born out of one individual. It is done by groups during that time. So that's why he can excuse that. He didn't say he was excusing it. You know why? Because he's, see, that's why both sides he can please. He won't say it plainly like that. That way, if a person thinks either or, he can meet both sides like this, like a ping pong. Bang, 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 bang. Oh, so I can keep both crowds over here. Now, you know me, I don't do that. I don't play tiddlywinks. I say it plainly as it is, and people unsubscribe. I can do this too, though. I can do this too. You ever talk to your pastor? He's a nice guy, right? I know how to do this too. You don't think I don't know how? I can do this too. But I have blood on my hands. I'm held accountable for teaching right doctrine, making it clear to people, this is right, this is wrong. But anyway, so... Here's his problem with his argument on trying to go like this with Roman Catholicism. Okay, if it's done by an individual that deviated from the historic work of Jesus Christ, then somewhere along the line, some individual did that, right? Introduced that Catholic doctrine, right, during that time? The word Catholic wasn't there that time, but he introduced that false doctrine which the Catholic Church later on took for themselves, right? So it's done by this one individual. The Catholic Church is a conglomeration of all sorts of wrong doctrines done by different individuals. So guess what? If we want to stick to his definition of a cult, then okay, then let me go by his definition. Catholicism is not a cult. It's a culmination of so many different cults because of so many different individuals who de deviated from the historic work of Jesus Christ introducing their doctrine here, their doctrine here, and the Catholic Church just took all of them. And they're a big, huge church of cults. Yeah. That's worse than any cult then yeah. over there. See, so I'm, if I'm going to tell it as it is, in the Word of God, Roman Catholicism, it's wrong in the Bible. I can't say it's right. I can't say it's okay. If the Bible says it's wrong, it's wrong. Right. I cannot... Look, as much as I can argue my way around it, or even if I want to, I can't go against the Bible. Amen, if God says something different, I have to choose Him, not on people's feelings like Zacharias was doing. Another issue that Zacharias went through is not just this uh, definition of cult, his definition of cult over here, but another issue was concerning about his prayer. Now, he gave a prayer at the White House, and actually, he did not pray in Jesus' name. You know why? Because if he prayed it in Jesus' name, if the government allowed that, then that would offend different religions over there. So because it would offend different religions over there, that's why he couldn't use Jesus' name. So people pointed that out to him. They said, why are you doing that? That's compromising. You know how Zacharias replied? He's intelligent. That's how he can please people. He said this way, I started my prayer, Holy Father, and then I concluded it in your precious name. See, so I'm not referring to any universal God out there. I'm referring only to the Christian God. So that's his way around that. But look, uh, it doesn't, so he tries to, why did he do that? Because he wanted to maintain the opportunity that, look, this is a great open door where Christian faith can represent Christianity and pray in front of the government White House. Okay, I get that mentality. That's what he's thinking. But it's not worth that kind of compromise where you neglect the name of Jesus Christ. If you think it's worth it, then should we, when the name of Jesus is what? Above every name. Isn't that the case? Mm -hmm. If it's above every name, then why would uh, the government allow Muslims who are given opportunity to say a prayer, they would start with Shahada, which is there is no God except for Allah and Muhammad, the messenger of God. So then uh, that name is above Jesus' name then. That's what Zacharias allowed. There are several Christian pastors who are asked to pray actually. And they actually did not compromise. They would say in Jesus' name, and actually at times when they were forbidden not to do that because they would get a lawsuit. So that's what Zacharias feared. That's what he insisted, that it was last minute, it was on the spot, and he had to do that. Look, even it's last minute on the spot, I'll say, no, I can't do it, sorry. It's that simple. It's that simple. 
There were people who walked out if they said, uh, you can't pray in Jesus' name. Some of these pastors actually said, no, I cannot do that then. Amen. Right, right. So that is something serious over there. Uh, the title of the article is Ravi Zacharias responds to NDP criticism, and that was his exact interview with Paul Edwards. With Paul Edwards. So you can look that up over there and see how Zacharias explained his reason, gave his excuse, actually. So I'm trying to give the source and give him the benefit of the doubt and his explanations. Now, another problem is not just this one, but another issue is concerning about, I don't know if you, all of you have heard of this, it's, it's like a discipleship course, it's called Alpha. I don't know if you ever heard of this course before, but it was kind of hitting pretty big. This is by Nicky Gumbel, okay? I don't know if I pronounced his last name right, but Nicky Gumbel, he was very popular and it was making big hits throughout campuses, college campuses, and youth, young people. Now, there's an article uh, by Damien Thompson. And Damien Thompson, he has an article titled Alpha Male, Can Nicky Gumbel and Holy Trinity Brompton Save the Church of England? In that article, you know what he mentioned over here? He mentioned this. Nicky Gumbel has been vicar of Holy Trinity since 2005. In 1996, Cardinal Hume invited a team from HDB to Westminster Cathedral so he could discover whether it was compatible with Catholicism. That really took us by surprise, Gumbel told me over tea in his vicarage last week. So that's what Gumbel uh, told Thompson. So Thompson's is all giving this uh, as a witness. It wasn't just, look what Gumbel says. <clears throat> it wasn't just that they were so enthusiastic it was that we hardly had to change our discipleship course, anything when we developed Alpha for Catholics. Wow. So his Christian discipleship course was already meant for the Catholic audience. And you know what he also says here? I love Catholics, he says with great emphasis, and it's interesting that he doesn't use the term Roman Catholics. No, when they do Alpha, I say to them, do not come to HTB, but go back to your Catholic parish. It's part of the church, and I love the whole church. Whoa. Now, I wouldn't say that God's hand is on this course, right? But uh, look what Ravi Zacharias said. Ravi Zacharias, he actually said over here, and all you have to do is just look up the video where Zacharias is being interviewed by Gumbel, okay? Just find that video and research it yourself. And basically, uh, Zacharias said this to Gumbel, Nikki, the Lord inspired you, brought a support team around you, and may it, may it just continue to grow. What, this kind of uh, course? No, that's not God. That's not God inspired over here. This is something demonic over here, to be honest. Am I being mean here? No, that's honest, because if this is something that meets up to the Catholic Church, which has a horde of mess of wrong doctrines, that's not godly. That's not God the Holy Spirit. That is a demonic spirit. And that is not being mean. That is just being, <clears throat> that is being truthful, speaking the truth in love. I mean, if I can't call it demonic, then what is demonic to you? What is demonic? <clears throat> Another thing is that Zacharias, uh, so, so notice very sympathetic toward Catholics over here, which I see it more and more. I'm sure he speaks out against the wrong doctrines of Catholic Church, but you notice how he's doing this so that he can open up connections. He can open up connections. Another... Th another statement that he said was that his comment on Henry Nguyen. Now, I don't know if you know Henry Nguyen, but a lot of his stuff is something very similar with uh, the New Age doctrine, actually. And that is plainly known if you read his works. So here's one example of his works, Henry Nguyen's works. He mentions, today I personally believe that while Jesus came to open the door to God's house, all human beings can walk through that door whether they know about Jesus or not. 
Today I see it as my call to help every person claim his or her own way to God. And uh, that work of his by Nguyen is actually documented in, let's see, over here, his book, Sabbatical Journey, New York Crossroad, uh, Crossroad Publishing, 1998, page 51. Now, what did Zacharias <clears throat> said about him? He actually said about Henry Nguyen, a pretty shocking statement. He said, one of the greatest saints of recent memory was Henry Nguyen. Wow. Now, uh, guess what happened? Because he had a lot of hot water on that, he retracted actually later on. But the problem is this. Look up his ministry online right now and type that name. And actually, I just saw it today recently where they just posted uh, Zacharias's good wording about Nguyen. Because why? Nguyen was something very influential to him. So right here, this is not good. This is not good. Even if he apologized, his ministry is still continuing it. You know why? Zacharias is not taking accountability here of making it pure. See that? Because this is where it's supposed to be purity is. So you have to be close to here as possible. No one is perfect, right? I admit that. But shouldn't we be as close as perfect as possible? Because we're held accountable for that in our lives? Now, this is the cost of what happened when he talked at, uh, at the Mormon Tabernacle. This is by Deseret News, and that's something of Utah. That's the Utah's own uh, news concerning about Mormonism. Uh, Evangelical preaches at Salt Lake Tabernacle. Title of the article, November 15, 2004. Now, you know what the cost was for Zacharias to do that? The cost was this, where President Richard Moe of Fuller Theological Seminary was also there with Zacharias, and it says this, addressed a capacity crowd of several thousand, offering a stunningly candid apology to members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And noting, look, I'm reading from Utah's news, okay, Utah's own news. Noting that, <clears throat> noting that friendship has not come easily between our communities. He dubbed the evening historic and apologized, apologized that evangelicals have often misrepresented the faith and beliefs of the Latter-day Saints. Wow. Wow. This is by quote. This is on quote. Let me state it clearly. We evangelicals have sinned against you. Wow. Now, look at over here. Look at over here. Look. I, I thank God how the Lord used Billy Graham and Zacharias, but this is a radar alert because, look, I'm in San Francisco Bay Area. You don't think that I have to use wisdom on compromising how far I go? So I know what that is, okay? And I know it's impossible you get high up there without making connections and compromises somewhere. It's by this one. Now, I'm not going to include many myriad statements, as Zacharias said, actually. The reason why is I cannot 100% prove it, but to be quite honest, it is disturbing. There are people out there who says that he does approve the theory of evolution. But then you'll notice in his uh, Ligonier Ministries over there that uh, after Sproul condemns evolution, everyone's laughing and Zacharias is laughing. And he just simply says, everything what they say is right. Why? Because if he speaks out clearly, maybe that would get him into trouble? I don't know. Or he's playing both sides, or maybe the rumor is false. I don't know. But then there are too many other rumors. I've heard him mention his comment on the shack. Now, you know the shack is a blasphemous uh, work. You know that, right? They claim that the Trinity manifested itself into a girl and... Uh, uh, an animal too, right? I, I don't know. I don't recall from memory. But that God the Father transformed himself into like a totally different... Uh, God, the Trinity, transformed into a totally different gender or stuff like that. So then, Zacharias, he mentioned that he doesn't approve of the book, but then he mentions, I know the author and he really loves Jesus and I told him not to worry about it. So... 
but he's trying to say, but I don't agree with it doctrinally. It is leaning towards something that is very dangerous, he says. So you notice what he's doing? It's this. No enemies. Then both sides can be happy with him. Smart. I know how to do that too. Why do you think my YouTube, I mean, praise the Lord how the Lord grew, but you know why? Because I was using wisdom on where I could go. But I know which subjects got you onlineers watching me right now to unsubscribe. I don't shy away from that. Amen, you know why? Because you entrust me. You entrust me with the responsibility to be non-compromising, to give you the truth. So I can't let you down on that one. And I'm not going to play politics. That way I can keep you in my channel. Amen. Now look at first, uh, 2 John 1. You know what Zacharias did? This is the cost of not knowing so much doctrine. Zacharias, he gave a great conclusion at his speech at the Mormon tabernacle, but he had to say the wrong words at the end. He said, God bless you. What does the Bible say in 2 John 1? Look at verse 8. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. You can lose a full reward at the judgment seat of Christ. What is the thing? The thing is compromise. Verse 9, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, and that includes Mormonism, hath not God, he that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither what? Bid him Godspeed. You can't say God bless you. Verse 11, For he that biddeth him Godspeed is what? Partaker of his evil deeds. Zacharias, I believe the Lord has used him mightily with a lot of fruits. But you know what I personally believe? This is just personal opinion. People can believe it differently. But my personal opinion, he lost a lot of his fruits. 90 to 99%. Why? Because he kept doing this. Look, I know that Zacharias is trying to maintain a right doctrine stance. But when you keep doing this, you're not going to, you will slip up somewhere. And that's why he slipped up right there. He slipped up right there. Uh, his answer, look at Colossians chapter 4. Here's something that very much troubles me. I thank God his intellectual answers, rational answers, and philosophical answers. I use that too. I use that when I address atheism, evolution, and sometimes Calvinism. I would do that. Uh, but, I also endure, uh, but I also use a lot of other arguments. Theology, science. But the most important thing is actually the Bible. Now, one thing I would like to ask you is this. Ravi Zacharias, in his answers, how much scripture did he use? That's why if you're not grounded in the Bible, what's going to happen? I can use philosophy for the glory of God, but God warned you about philosophy. So how do we know the limitation when philosophy is bad, right? Over here, when is it bad over here? When it tends to go more toward this way rather than what that way bible now let's be honest what do you think in your honest sincere god the holy spirit leading your heart where do you think he's leaning more towards where do you think he's leaning more towards i'm not saying he's all the way here okay cross this line he's here but where is he going more that's troubling to me that's troubling to me so I thank God his philosophy, but he's going more toward here than the Bible. All right, let's look at Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy. That's why he hits a lot of use. It's getting spoiled. People are being spoiled. Through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. That's very dangerous. So, look, existential arguments are great. I think that's Zacharias' forte. Actually, uh, I wrote a final comprehensive exam on existential psychotherapy, actually. That's the hardest, actually, and I passed. I really enjoyed it. But, see, we're, one thing you're going to know about your pastor is he's not an existential preacher. What do you mostly know me as? What do people online mostly know me as? And that should be my reputation, amen?